it's, it's a weird thing to think about with the trade deadline. It's a month and a half away. And coming into the season, I probably would have thought, hey, you know what? Maybe the Jays get a huge bat to make the lineup mm-hmm. from great to elite. Or they add another uh, late inning bullpen arm like a Liam Hendricks or somebody to come in and save situations if Romano's not available or you just have a backup, right? Now it's like, you know, they could use a starter. They could use a big bat. They could use help in the bullpen. They need, <laughs> they need help in all three areas. And uh, you're, I'm, they can middle of the road farm system you're one top prospect um ricky tiedem has been injured most of the year i don't look I'm, I'm i'm not really comfortable sitting here saying like oh yeah ross atkins will have a huge trade deadline this year like i don't know if i love the idea of them we're bitching about depth now well how do you go and add at the trade deadline if you're already devoid of depth you it's know like, like this is a this is yeah. a hard problem to solve i think they kind of just have to roll with the group they have and hope some things sort themselves out internally so uh, Nick Ashbourne over at Sportsnet.ca wrote a piece about some starting pitchers the Jays could target to just try to get them through this sort of stretch here. Um, the first name he brought up was Ben Lively from the Cincinnati Reds, 31 year old, but he was uh, he was a bit of a late bloomer because he still got like he's pre arb still, so he's still <laughs> he's still under team control, which would bring up the cost a little bit. Joey Lucchesi, who at one point was a really really big prospect, um, he's a name that they mentioned. Chase Anderson, a former friend of ours. Uh, oh, wow. with the Colorado Rockies, 35 years old. I don't know if I love that. Paulo Espino from the Nationals eats innings. That's how Ashbourne described him. None of those are really sexy names, but none of them, I guess, should cost you that much with the exception of Lively, who, again, because he's got team control, might be pretty valuable to some other organizations. I think they need to go get tre- a second version of Trevor Richards, right? A guy who you need him for one inning, good. He could maybe give you three if you need it, but... Maybe like that's why Asino in Washington, I read minutes or innings eater, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'd sign me up for him. But it's tough to make trades right now. It's only the early June. Yeah, it is. Like, I don't think it's it's hard to imagine them going out and grabbing a starter. And the, something we should also mention is like we've we've talked a million times about how much more competitive the American League is this year in regards to the playoffs not being an automatic like it was last year. Mm-hmm. And since there's more teams that are good, there's fewer teams selling, more teams in the mix buying those players that are selling. So if you're even like an Oakland A's or you know a Washington or a team like that who sucks, who's obviously going to sell, you can sit there and wait. Yeah, you're, you're not in any rush. This year. Yeah, you're not in any rush. Like we 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 could really use Ross Atkins. Where we talked about that trade uh, that they made in 2021. They sent Joe Panic and some random prospect. I think it was Andrew McInvale or something. That he he wasn't even like a top 30 prospect yeah. at that time in the system. And they got themselves Simber. Like the, they need Atkins to go out and make a deal like that again. Like a yeah. very very clear win for a relief pitcher. Someone that can, but this time it's not like a late inning arm. It's just like we need somebody who can be there on the bullpen day throwing three innings, two innings. You talked about the competitiveness in the AL. Like last year, on I'm looking as of August 1st last year, the standings were, you know, Cleveland, Chicago were kind of in the mix. Baltimore, I guess, was still kind of making their push. Boston was. So the AL had about four teams in the bubble, but the NL, like very quickly from August one on, like fell off the face of the earth. San Fran, I think by August 10th was like eight out. This year, I don't think that's going to be the case. Like you said, I think we're going to be sitting there and looking at teams that are way like a way more competitive thing. Who knows where Boston will be at? I think Seattle could keep themselves in the mix. The American League should still have a lot of competitive teams. And in the NL, like San Fran, Philly, San Diego, Cincinnati, the Mets, all within three games of a wild card spot. So there are a lot of teams in the mix in the National League, too. So you're right. A lot of buyers this year. Look at, like, let's count how many buyers there could be. Tampa should be a buyer. Baltimore should be a buyer. Texas, the Yankees, the Jays, the Astros. The Angels are five games above 500. You'd think they'd obviously want to go for it with Otani. Boston's 33 and 33. I don't know if I'd expect them to be a buyer. You look at these Central Division teams, Minnesota, Cleveland, and there's Seattle. They're under 500. That's like 10 teams right there. And in the National League, Atlanta, Arizona, Miami, the Dodgers, the Pirates are in the mix. The Brewers in the mix, the Giants are over 500. Philadelphia has high expectations. The Mets have high expectations. There's like 17 teams you can very easily make the case for that are mm-hmm. like, you should be buying to try and make the playoffs. Last year, there was, you know, less than 10. 10. 10. Yeah. Some of the teams that were in the playoffs last year, you're like, oh, yeah, you're here by default. Yeah. Like, you're not even really a playoff team. <laughs> it's completely different this year. 